Hello and welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that exposes Pakistan's role and nexus in promoting global terrorism and its funding. Here are the headlines. Dreaded terrorist in Pakistan on the fray for gender elections. Anti-terrorism act misused by Islamabad in occupied Gilgit, Baltistan. India accuses Pakistan for sponsoring terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. And election year witnesses more terror attacks in Afghanistan, says UN body. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, which is known for nurturing terrorism. The country remains home to many terror outfits who have been enjoying the patronage of Pakistan Army and spy agency, the ISI. As the country is ready to go for polls on July 25th, there are many terrorists who are on the fray for Pakistan general elections. We have a report. Meet Maulana Fazlur Rahman Khalil, a cleric who was placed by the US government on specially designated global terrorist list on September 2014 for his alleged role in Harkatul Muzahedin militant organization. Khalil recently extended his support to Imran Khan's party, Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf, in the general elections. In the run to win the elections, almost all other parties have struck Fustian bargains with one or the other radical Islamist parties. Leaders and candidates have been virtually prostrating themselves before the leaders of the extremist Sunni party, Alhe Sunnat Wal Zamad, the new avatar of Sipai Sahaba Pakistan, seeking their support in their constituencies, especially in Punjab and Karachi. Experts believe Pakistanis need to be more concerned over the deep inroads made by the Islamist groups in the country's politics. It is not, will not uh, augur well. Um, it, it won't be ni uh, um, n nice for the uh, new democracy which is coming up or Pakistan is struggling to become a democracy. But this will show to the Committee of Nations that what is the reality of Pakistan. And once again I say the Pakistan army must be approached by all uh, the world leaders and made to explain that they, until and unless they come to the democratic value systems, this will not work out. It will be against the you know, peaceful uh, development in the regional areas around the border. India will be affected, other, affected, other countries will be affected. Lashkari Toiba's political wing, Mili Muslim League, and the extremist Barelvi Muslim Party, Tehrike Labek Pakistan, have incidentally put up more candidates than the Pakistan People's Party in the Punjab Assembly elections. Mumbai terror attack mastermind Hafiz Said is aggressively campaigning to make inroads into Pakistan's mainstream politics. He is fighting elections on the agent of its anti-India and anti-US campaign. If Hafiz Said in Pakistan has not been able to, has not been removed, obviously Pakistan as a government has decided to rehabilitate Hafiz Said, that is what it means. He probably is thinking of election, electioneering, he is thinking, he's thinking of a political post. So all these things are also included. You see, when a country wants to head towards democratic systems, then they take all the necessary steps. I am not saying that uh, a terrorist should be allowed to continue, but the question is, we have to go into the fact. If Hafiz Saeed is working towards becoming a um, peaceful political body, then it has to be seen. Otherwise, Pakistan should take necessary action against this gentleman so that he does not continue his terrorist activities at all. General elections 2018 has been violence-filled and full of controversy, giving rise to great uncertainty over the future of the country. In the span of one week, three deadly attacks in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan led to the death of over 150 people and saw over 250 getting injured. Former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and his daughter Maryam have been jailed after they were convicted, along with his son-in-law Savdar, on charges of corruption related to the ownership of four luxurious flats in London. In the aftermath of the conviction, the police opened criminal cases against 17,000 members of Sharif's Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz PMLN, which just completed a five-year term in power. The impact of these developments on the elections remains uncertain for now. 
Experts believe elections in Pakistan already remained violent and rigged. A lot of political leaders have lost their lives in the electioneering processes. Uh, I, I think Madam Bhutto also uh, was one of them. And so that are all the names you have taken. But the question is that we must understand that Pakistan army supports these radical elements to remain in power. Ever since Pakistan army changed its stand and took a religious mantle after Ziaul Haq's time, they have now become very, 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 you know, holier than thou from the religious angle. And that is why they have to support these people and these people support them to remain in power. So it is, it is, you, you scratch my back and I scratch your back. It's the same system going on. So these terrorist organization are also pro-army and Pakistan army has to support them because they have no other choice. The Independent Human Rights Commission of Pakistan said there were ample grounds to doubt the legitimacy of the elections and criticized blatant, aggressive and unabashed attempts to manipulate the outcome of the upcoming elections. In a statement issued recently, the group added it reaffirms the public perception that all parties have not been given equal freedom to run the election campaigns. The larger participation of the hardline Islamist and terrorist in the elections has raised concerns for the international community. Now we take you to Gilgit, Baltistan, a part of erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which remains under Pakistani occupation for the past seven decades. Recently, the people of Gilgit, Baltistan have been subjected to severe human rights violation, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. Recently, the infamous Anti-Terrorism Act of Pakistan is being enforced on the residents. Newsweek South Asia has a report. In a flagrant violation of the law, the Anti-Terrorism Act of Pakistan, which was introduced to expeditiously bring the perpetrators of terror to justice, has become a tool of extrajudicial killings and repression for the autocratic establishment of Islamabad. Security forces have been brazenly misusing the law in occupied territory of Gilgit, Baltistan. Security forces have been brazenly misusing the law in occupied territory of Gilgit, Baltistan. The activists and other reasonable voices from across the region are being arbitrarily arrested, detained and sometimes even hacked to death on pretext of homeland security. The Inter-Services Intelligence, which plays an instrumental role in preparing the list of the people to be trial under Section 4, an even despotic and ambiguous section of the law, has shortlisted as many as 140 people from Gilgit, Baltistan. Experts believe people in Gilgit, Baltistan are annoyed by the exploitation and persecution by Pakistan. तो लोगों में काफी गुस्सा है पाकिस्तान के खिलाफ अभी 28 मई को जो एक ऑर्डर पास किया था वो एक कोशिश है उसको गिलगिट बाल्टिस्तान को पांचवा प्रांत बनाने की तो लोग वहां पे प्रोटेस्ट कर रहे हैं क्योंकि लॉ वगैरह जो भी कोई कानून बनाने की जो शक्तियां हैं वो प्राइम मिनिस्टर के पास चली गई हैं इसलिए जब लोग प्रोटेस्ट कर रहे हैं तो वहां पे लोगों को एंटी टेररिस्ट एक्ट सेक्शन 4 में अंदर बंद करके ट्रायल किया जा रहा है जबकि वो नॉर्मल ह्यूमन राइट्स के ऊपर डेवलपमेंट के ऊपर बाकी चीजों के ऊपर प्रोटेस्ट है तो एक तरह से वहां पे गिलगिट बाल्टिस्तान में जो हो रहा है वो ह्यूमन राइट वायलेशन है सब कुछ पाकिस्तान के इशारे पे होता है और उन वहां से उनको खत्म किया जा रहा है एक तरह से 
The Schedule 4, which was essentially formulated to keep a judicial vigil on those indirectly associated with the terrorist organizations or with previous criminal records, has been used as an instrument to muzzle the dissenting voices of the region that has dared to raise against the establishment. Pakistan's nefarious designs have been exposed time and again. Earlier, Baba Jan, a renowned political personality of the region, was also held through this act and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Anguish leaders of the region say that Islamabad has no jurisdiction to impose and target the people of the region. They also say that Pakistan has exploited their innocence and ignorance. आज तक हमने एंटी टेररिज्म कोर को अगर गिलगित बल्तिस्तान में बर्दाश्त किया है तो ये हमारा बड़ापन है हमारी कमजोरी नहीं है हमारी कमजोरी नहीं है आज तक हमने शेड्यूल फोर को गिलगित बल्तिस्तान में कबूल किया है तो ये हमारा बड़ापन है और वो इसलिए कबूल किया था तुम्हारी चाल से ना बलत थे तुम्हारी साजिश it is believed that Islamabad is acting on the behest of Beijing to make success the multi-billion dollar China-Pakistan economic corridor, which passes through the illegally occupied territory of Gilgit Baltistan. Look, that territory is illegally occupied. Because it is Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which is the legal part of Bharat's being, which is our instrument of assertion signed by it. अब पाकिस्तान ने उस पे कब्जा कर लिया है और वहाँ पे लोगों को कोई वोटिंग राइट नहीं है वहाँ पे कोई भी सोलत नहीं है डेवलपमेंट नाम की कोई चीज़ नहीं है जो ये कॉरिडोर बनाया जा रहा है ये वहाँ से गुजरेगा और इस प्रांत को कंट्रोल करना पाकिस्तान के लिए बहुत इम्पॉर्टेंट है क्योंकि ये प्रांत एक लिंक है चाइना और पाकिस्तान के बीच में इसलिए अगर यहाँ पर कोई बगावत होती है तो पाकिस्तान उसको कुचलने की Army generals working in cahoots with the tyrants of Islamabad have exploited the people of this region for more than seven decades and today, when the people have started asking for their rightful share of rights, they are being subjected to extreme high-handedness. In recent times, a slew of suppressive legislation has been forced upon the people of Gilgit Baltistan in a quiet bid to keep them marginalized and deprived. Any voice seeking to peacefully combat the status quo has been crushed with brute force. Moving on, Pakistan-backed terrorists continue to carry out attacks in Jammu and Kashmir with an aim to create instability in the region. Recently, India has hit back at Pakistan over its comments on the alleged human rights abuse in Kashmir. New Delhi has also told Islamabad to stop supporting terrorism and terrorist entities which are operating out of Pakistan. We have a report. Pakistan, which remains a safe haven for terror outfits, has once again been slammed by India for promoting terrorism and spreading malicious propaganda in the name of Kashmir. India's Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson Ravish Kumar said that Islamabad had to first stop terrorism emanating from its soil. He further spoke about the Pakistan Foreign Office raising concern over shifting of women separatist leader Saida Asiya Andrabi to Tihar jail and detention of Hurriyat leaders Shabbir Ahmad Shah, Masrat Alam Bhatt. Andrabi was arrested by the National Investigation Agency under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act UAPA, for allegedly carrying out cessationist activity and waging war against India. From this forum several times I have reacted on the same issue. You see, I think they sometimes forget that, uh, you know, I mean, what they preach, they don't follow. And time and again, we have told them that, uh, you know, they have to stop supporting terrorism. They have to support, uh, they have to stop supporting terrorist entities which are operating out of Pakistan. I think uh, that is something which, uh, on which they have taken no action. So, uh, you know, I think, I don't think I need to kind of always dignify what they, whatever they have to say. I think our position on this uh, remains very clear and consistent. 
This response comes days after the Pakistan's role in the United Nations report on Kashmir, which falsely accused the Indian security forces of human rights violations. Recently, in a sensational revelation, a Pakistani Islamist based in Canada had admitted that the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayed Rad Al Hussein, was in constant touch with him while preparing the human rights report on Kashmir. Zafar Bangash, who lives in Toronto in Canada, is an Islamic movement journalist and an imam at the Islamic Society of York Region's mosque. I can say to you, and I say it with all humility, but with great pride, that we, the Friends of Kashmir, also have a role in the production of this report. In fact, I have personal correspondence with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, email correspondence in which he responded to my personal letter and email saying that he would like to have access to both lines of control. That means in Azad Kashmir as well as in Indian occupied Kashmir. Despite all accusations, Jammu and Kashmir state continues to suffer as militants who are trained and supported by Pakistan attack the residents of Ghulam Mohadin of National Conference Party. A policeman was killed and another seriously injured in the attack. The security forces intensified its cordon and search operations in the state that led to an encounter in the support district. <laughs> और वो पार्टी भी फायर करके चले कोई हमारे किसी भी जवान का कोई नुकसान नहीं है कॉर्डन कर रखा है हमने अभी घेरा डाल रखा है देखते जल्दी पकड़े जाएंगे कहीं नहीं जाएंगे Be it the Taliban, Haqqani Network, Lashkar-e Taiba, or Jaisi Muhammad, Pakistan remains a safe haven for these dreaded terror organizations. Working on the behest of Pakistan's army and intelligence agencies, these outfits are creating mayhem in Jammu and Kashmir since 1989. Let's move on to Afghanistan, where another bomb blast in the city of Kabul has raised more questions on the Ashraf Ghani government. On the other hand, the United Nations published a report which mentioned the spike in the terrorist attack by the various non-state actors in the country. Newsweek South Asia has a look. Another terror strike in Afghanistan's capital city of Kabul. This time, a suicide blast took place close to the Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development that killed at least 10 people. The Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack. This is the second attack on the ministry in just over a month. The attack comes days after the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan said 1,692 civilians were killed during the first six months of 2018, the most recorded in the period over the last decade since the agency began documentation. This happens to be the year when Afghanistan goes to the elections. The combined use of suicide and non-suicide IEDs caused nearly half of all civilian casualties. Continuing the trends first documented last year by UNAMA, the majority of IED casualties were caused by suicide and complex attacks which again were responsible for record high civilian casualties. Among 1,413 civilian casualties includes 427 deaths, 986 injuries. This is a 22% increase in the attacks. Yes, this is an election year and <clears throat> one was expecting greater stability as far as the Afghan situation is concerned to be running through an election, uh, proper election and having a democratic government elected. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the president of Afghanistan has to take the blame for it. Uh, in spite of the fact that there has been an spike in the deployment of UN troops. After all, they had about 8,000 earlier, which was increased by about 3,000 by President Trump. But of course, uh, though there was an increase of 3,000, actually more than 8,000 troops were already there in Afghanistan. NATO is also increasing its commitment. In fact, today's report is that uh, even England is going to increase its commitment. So, uh, with all these forces also, they have not been able to bring the situation to a point where a free and fair election can be assured across Afghanistan. 
terror organizations based in Pakistan want to overthrow the democratic government in Afghanistan as they have no faith in the so-called democratic laws and demand the establishment of the Sharia law in the state. People living in Kabul, Nangarhar, Helmand and Kandahar were among those who were most impacted by the conflict. The problem, however, would start where the terrorist organizations based in Pakistan targets the democratic government in Kabul. I think almost everything that you see in Afghanistan has got a Pakistani hand behind it. They are the ones who calibrate the whole story. If you look into this terrorist groups, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's uh, Taliban, whether it's Haqqani, or whether it's uh, the uh, IS group, the IS Khorasan province, that, as they call it, ISKP, uh, a lot of them, and in fact most of them, have their bases in Pakistan. They also have some bases across in Afghanistan. When they are under pressure in Afghanistan, they cross over to bases in Pakistan. U.S. General John Nicholson, who has led U.S. and NATO forces in the country since 2016, echoed U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who last week promised U.S. support for Afghan President Ashraf Ghani's bid to start peace talks with the Taliban. But experts believe that the Taliban wouldn't appear for the peace talks. Basically, if such offers to terrorist groups are successful you get them to the table when you have broken the back of the terrorist groups and they understand it very clearly, they have no future in terms of pursuing the mission through armed means. That's when they normally come to the negotiating table. And when you have the upper hand over the terrorist groups, that's when you can push your agenda through. At the moment, uh, it's, I would say, at par with both the sides uh, having equal kind of success. After all, when you look at it, perhaps 60-65% of the area is under the government's control. The balance is either being contested or under control of the Taliban or other groups. So, uh, I don't really see them all of a sudden coming in for uh, dialogue at this point in time. With just three months remaining until the elections, the Afghan government needs to convince its citizens that it is capable of holding free and fair elections and safeguarding them while doing so. If it cannot protect the voters and successfully carry out an election, the legitimacy of the government and its democratic institutions will suffer. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Surbhi Sharma signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.